Hello and welcome. I am the Letter Hack, and with me now is a very special guest, the Majority of Report's very own film guy, movie editor, the closest thing I'll ever have to a professor, Matthew Film Guy, a.k.a. Matthew L. Weiss. Matthew, thank you for being here. How are you? I am great. It's a pleasure to be here, Matt. Thanks for having me. Sure. Did you uh, recognize Sam Cedar at the intro yeah. there? Yeah, I gave me a, quite a chuckle. <laughs> I, I use that without permission. Um, I'm sure he's okay with it. Yeah. Uh, you're in the hot seat, man. That's what we call it. You're going to watch me draw you. I'm in the hot seat, too, because I'm going to watch you watch me draw you. So there's pressure. That's kind of kinky, but okay. Well, here we go. <laughs> First question right off the bat, why do Christmas movies only come out at Christmas time? Mm, I'm, I wonder if I'm questioning the premise. Uh, I think the majority come out that time, but, mm -hmm. you know, there's the eternal debate as to whether or not Die Hard is a Christmas movie. And I do believe oh. that came out during the summer. So uh, I could be wrong about that. Somebody will have to fact check me. But I, I was just joking around, but you are such a movie guy that you broke my question that was the perfect answer um okay <laughs> but that in some people's minds that's an argument that it's not really a christmas movie because it's it is yes it takes place but it doesn't come out at the season but yeah um you know, well if, it, go on oh i was gonna say if there's time i'm gonna mention a movie that also takes place during the holidays but no one has to watch it during the holiday you're you're right they they don't need to come out i was just making a stupid joke so here's the thing it was good i think the majority of the people that watch this show know you from no pun intended uh, from the majority report as yes. the film guy right that's sure. we have a leftist best audience here yeah. um so i was hoping that while i get in on this drawing I was hoping that you could give us your origin story um, and please tell us how you got into film editing and also how you've become such an aficionado of films as well. Okay, well, I guess I'll go in order. My origin story. Uh, uh, I, I first appeared in the last panel of issue 298. No. Um, <laughs> I actually... It's, they're sort of connected why and how uh, or just a, a byproduct of my being a, a, a film guy. Um, you know, the, the short story of all of that is that, you know, my dad and my grandfather, his father, were huge home movie enthusiasts, sort of amateur film guys. And my grandfather would shoot elaborate sort of, you know, films of his vacations and things more than just sort of home movies. He would make my dad and my uncle you know, act in little vignettes and things like that. So I think my father caught that from him and he went to school for theater and television and sort of had an inkling to do that for a living as well. Although he wound up just sort of joining corporate America sort of early on in his attempts to do so, but he always had that, you know, sort of itch. And so he bought a lot of the early home video equipment. And uh, when I was old enough, I was able to basically use that on my own and start making little silly skits and sketches and stuff like that with my friends. And, you know, eventually I heard of the concept of a film director. There's somebody who, you know, actually directs movies. Uh, that was actually my uncle, my dad's brother, who was like a, you know, he was a, a real film and movie, uh, you know, uh, and music enthusiast. Uh, you know, he was kind of like a Woodstock generation, but he loved all those early 70s movies, Scorsese and you know, Coppola and all that stuff. So he gave me a long list of movies to see as a teenager. And I was off from there. I went to film school, which is a thing that film guys do. And while I was there, I read a book on John Cassavetes because Martin Scorsese, who was like my original film guy crush as a youngster, uh, he said that John Cassavetes was his hero. So I said, well, I've got to see who this guy is. And I got way into John Cassavetes. And at the time, the only book really written by him in English was by this guy, Ray Carney. He was a film professor at Boston uh, University. Uh, actually, he still is. And uh, he, I, he had his email in the back of the book. So I emailed him and I said, like, oh, my God, you've blown my mind. And the book really did blow my mind. It was like this complete sort of alternative reading of film language that none of my film professors had really even broached. And to be honest, pissed most of them off when I tried to share it with them. But uh, it, 
long story short, he, when I moved to New York, he said, well, you know, let me put you in touch with some people who I think you would really like, get to know, and maybe you could be useful to them. I came to New York saying like, I just want to intern and work and learn and, you know, continue my education. And one of several key people was a young man named Samuel Lincoln Cedar. And uh, he had shown uh, Who's the Caboose to his class, Ray Carney. And so he was like a big fan of Who's the Caboose and thought Sam was really doing good stuff. And I mean, you know, the guy wasn't always right about everything. But um, <laughs> he, uh, you know, put me in touch with Sam and I wound up being Sam's assistant on his movie, Bad Situationist, which is now a lost classic. Um, and then actually the funniest part is that Sam actually wound up, he was the star of the movie as well. He wound up casting me to play his character's assistant. So I would always be there on set, like holding a notebook that he really needed as the director. And I was just sort of always in the background. And uh, I've yeah. I've seen that. What's that? I've seen that. Oh, you've seen it. Okay. You're one of the great. Yeah. You were fantastic in that. I thought it was hilarious. Well, thank you very much. Um, that's what led to my fame and fortune that you see here today. Um, was my, uh, But yeah, that's... And then Sam went on to, you know, have his uh, film uh, career sort of tailor off. Uh, he actually also made... I don't know, did you also see a pilot season? The, the yeah. series sequel to... And I was in that in a small role as well. Um, and he just kept in touch with me after all that. And when he moved over to Air America and started doing uh, political stuff. We just sort of, uh, you know, he kept hiring me to do things like go to the RNC and pretend to be a, a, um, uh, a volunteer for the 2004 RNC in New York and like film some undercover stuff. So I did that a little bit. So we just always sort of kept in touch. And then when he started the majority report podcast, you know, he had that guy, Chris Rosen on, who was not really a film critic doing his movie segment. He was more of a PR guy. And I kept listening to him give the most inane, ridiculous movie segments, suggesting the most basic movies of all time with little to no actual insight. And it became kind of a running joke, like, you're not even a film guy. You're just a PR guy. Eventually, I said, Sam, Sam, I should do this segment. He's like, you're right, you should. And I don't know, now we're going on uh, 10 or 11, 12 years, maybe even. So there you go. That's that's my origin story in terms of the film guy. And also he had a friend who was a lawyer. So whenever I would call in or be there, he would be like, this is Matthew lawyer, or this is Matthew film guy. That's how he differentiated us. And it wasn't so much that I was like such a film guy, although it became that, but he called me Matthew film guy just for his own memory, I think, or to keep it clear for the show who he was talking about. And then it's just become my brand for which, you know, I owe him nothing. It just, it just so happens that he used those words for me, but we have a, uh, I didn't we have a know dispute. that. Yeah. I, that's all new to me. That's this is gold. Um, gold, gold, Jerry. But yeah, that's Sam is the one who anointed me, Matthew film guy. So it's, you know, somewhat tongue in cheek. Well, you that, know, it's is that, cool. Is that, really, is that really my complexion? No, I'm just kidding. I won't yeah. have you <laughs> as you draw this. I was explaining to you cause you're a comic book guy. Like you get it. Um, you're a film guy. I'm the comic book guy. And I've pitched that to Majority Report. I've said, you got the film guy. Bring on the comic book guy. Let's go, right? It's not working yeah. out that way, though. Well, um, look, as as they've got room for one sort of niche bit where, like, most people don't really like what I've re recommended. <laughs> you know, I don't know if they have oh. room for, for two where they, you know, again, I'm not to knock comics in any way, but it's just, I think it's probably just a smaller audience. He can at least make oh, fun you're of right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe we could do a duo and talk about comic book movies, but then again, I don't really want to. I'm not sure you do either. Um, I've kind of had my fill of it. They keep wanting to, you know, just for years, the conversation would return to comic book movies just because they so they loom so large in the public imagination. But yeah, I mean, you know, I don't I don't not watch them. It's just I don't have much to say about them. So I don't I tend to not bring them up, but I quite enjoy them for what they are. And yes, you're right. I was a comic book guy, you know, as a kid, I was a comic book collector. And then in my teens, I got like serious and would go to like conventions and comic book stores and started, you know, hoarding comics legitimately bagging and boarding and organizing and putting them in a database and doing all the obsessive compulsive things that real comic guys do. I, I was doing that earlier today. Okay. So 
Um, I was going to ask you this later, so I'll just ask you now. Like, is there a ratio for you when it comes to a movie, like, um, like, or or how how would you how would you measure like how much, how, like, if movies are one part entertainment, one part artistic express, expression, mm-hmm. what's the balance? Is it like, what what matters more? when to a movie Uh, like i know what it is for me but like for you is it and is that what makes a movie like is it is it a balance of entertaining and artistic expression or is there yeah yeah, there's a there's an argument to that i mean it depends really on what you mean by the word like that's the problem we get into these conversations where everyone assumes we all mean the same thing by the same word but you know i've always thought of entertainment as just simply being diverted from your worries which is wonderful and great and like i can appreciate a movie that does that successfully and sometimes let's say most times in terms of just what i'm spending my literal viewing hours on it's mostly that kind of thing the other kind it's deeper it's more rewarding it's also more challenging it requires more effort and energy but the payoff i think is greater too Um, so it's not even like each movie has the ratio. It's that maybe you're in the mood for one thing and you're not for the other, Hmm. you know, it's like how much ratio between Chinese food and pizza should every meal have, Hmm. you know, like sometimes you're in the mood for Chinese food. Sometimes you're in the mood for pizza, uh, or, you know, some other food metaphor. It's not coming to me right now. But well, also, so, you know, there are movies like I know what you're saying, because there are some movies that you're like gripped, right? Like you're you know what I like to call. And this is something that I got from that guy, Ray Carney, who always talked about it in this way. And it makes so much sense. Like our limbic system. Right. We have that baseline reptilian brainstem that we share with like all, you know, so many more animals um, that just have fight or flight. So that's like the basic trigger that you can sort of, you know, touch. And, you know, some movies are content to just be really good at punching that part of your brain. But then there's the sort of the higher mammalian brainstem and, and, you know, the sort of, you know, higher reasoning, higher sense of spirituality, all these other kind of levels to consciousness that we don't share with reptiles that are, you know, a little further along the evolutionary ladder. And some movies try to just speak to that area of our lives. Uh, Now, both kinds of movies can simply fail, right? So you're just like, this is a bad movie. It meant to be entertaining and it just wasn't. Or it, you know, meant to be deep and it just wasn't. Or it meant to be, you know what I'm saying? So that's, that's another sort of qualitative judgment. But, you know, in terms of like kinds of movies, there there are movies that have aspects of both. And then there are some that are just like, I don't think anybody would call like a Tarkovsky movie. I don't know if you've ever seen any Andre Tarkovsky, just to give one obvious example, entertaining. But I mean, I've been in the grips of one that's just like, I wasn't looking at my watch. I wasn't checking out the lighting around, you know, like I was I was locked in, but I can't say i was like entertained but i was also i wasn't struggling to pay attention and you know that's a whole other side of things is some movies require more attention and either you or it fail to bring your attention to it fully um but that doesn't that alone doesn't necessarily mean it was trying to be and failing to be entertaining so it's a very gray area to me the line between these these two concepts so um I mean, all of that's got to be taken into account during the um, when when you're editing a movie. Um, what's a typical editing process like? And do you have moments before you start where you have to like collect yourself or or clear your mind? It, so that because here's the thing, like I always wonder this, is it OK to be influenced by all the movies you've seen? Right. Like you see as many movies as you can. Right. So like, yeah, how could you not be? Yeah. So are you like editing a film and you're like, oh, no, I'm just sitting here doing uh, what's her name? Uh, Thelma Schoonmaker all all day long. Or like, is there if only I could now here's the here's the real here's the real answer to this question. Like the kinds of movies that I'm 
getting to edit. I, I'm sort of lucky in that I'm I'm not just making total trash. I'm making these sort of indie movies that have the freedom to be somewhat more personal, especially Black mm-hmm. Bear. That was like the real gift of that movie is it yeah it was a sort of um you know it was at sundance it was uh you know in this sort of silo of uh you know a kind of a side of the movie business it wasn't completely obscure and and, and you know just festivals and you know obscure sort of european style cinema it had its entertaining aspects to it um but it also was a very personal vision of the director so but not all of them were like that. You know, it depends on the movie you're editing. Like I, I definitely haven't gotten the chance to work with a filmmaker who is interested in something like Tarkovsky or Brisson or, you know, like Kiristami or Nuri Bilge Ceylon or some of these international guys, Hong Sang Su or We're Asa the Cool. Were you in class for any of the We're Asa the Cool movies, the Thai, uh, the Thai film guy? Name a movie. Did we watch Cemetery of Splendor? Maybe it was like, yeah, well, what was the one? What, what was the one where they were catatonic in a hospital? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a uh, um uh, uh that, that, that was, that's not the same no, guy. Yeah, that's him. That's exactly him. Oh, okay. That's, yeah. That's um that's Cemetery of Splendor, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that was yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Like, now was that <laughs> was that entertaining? It was that because it was it's just so trippy. You know, it's like mind blowing. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's get this out of the way. Like, yeah. I, I do want to talk to you about editing, but in terms of the class, you intentionally. Okay, I've been in and out of your film class for what, over a year now, right? Seems like it. Yeah. And and I'm missing the current semester, and it's just killing me. Um, I, I miss those weekly discussions with the group so much. But you typically choose films for us that will challenge us. And, and stuff that we wouldn't naturally gravitate to, right? You intentionally do that, right? Can you just describe how you go about choosing movies for our group discussions? Yeah, it's easy. I, I, I choose movies that challenge me, you know? Like, I'm looking for the guys that I know. Like, for instance, I had seen some We Are Asked of the Cold movies before, so I was just like, I got to see everything this guy has done. And yes, the, the, the sort of ballywick of the class is join me if you're willing to go down this rabbit hole with me so yeah there it's not we're not going to be watching any james cameron movies or even martin scorsese movies really you know like we're, we're going to be watching the heavy hitters the, the the people who are taxing our resources of intelligence emotional sensitivity patience concentration all of these things that go into what requires a, a movie like that requires so i'm doing it to challenge myself I, and really it's like you know, I describe it as like a book club for movies. You sort of make yourself have to pay attention and sit down and, and watch a movie that you may be feeling too lazy or too not up to or whatever. When I get a chance to talk about it with all these great people such as yourself and have a reason to kind of chew it over, it's like it makes it so much more uh, available, accessible and, and enriching. So how do I pick them? Yeah, I'm I'm picking the from reputation because it's all movies I haven't also seen, which is the fun part for me. When I first started doing the class, I was showing all my favorites and that got boring pretty quickly, but I'm picking movies that will challenge me that, that require that extra, like, huh? Like, you know, blow my mind, tax me to, to the limits of my understanding and let's wrestle with it together. And, you know, I can usually tell, uh, like for instance, when I've seen the other movies by the same director, I kind of know what we're in for. But also just from reading, I try not to read too much so I don't spoil myself because it's all about me not seeing the movie too. But I just pick right. pick ones that are known to be challenging. And I pick some really challenging ones and then I pick some ones that are like, oh, that's just sort of that's a good movie. Okay, so you mentioned Black Bear, um, which you edited. And so I'm, I'm watching that movie with my wife and, and it's one of the first times I ever watched a movie where I'm like well aware of who edited it the the thing right and and so i so that was present in my mind i was thinking about it the whole time and i couldn't help but think i if i had been the person tasked with editing that film i would have been just sheer panic at the outset like where do you start how do you do it do you ever feel like like is editing a film thrilling 
Is it stressful? Like, what's the general? Oh, it's fucking stressful, dude. Yeah. yeah. You. What makes you think I didn't just wig out? You know. So that's <laughs> like, that's natural. One foot in front of the other. Like, don't you feel before you started an entire comic, you're just like, where do I even start? I got a blank page. Uh, you know, maybe yeah. it's not even as scary because it's not even a blank page. I'm given this footage. Somebody's already thought like, here, this. I know this is going to go together somehow. And and actually, the way Larry shoots is was so much more dedicated to the actors, which is like my favorite kind of movie, really. Mm-hmm. That it wasn't like Hitchcock storyboarded like this goes with this goes with this. So it wasn't just me putting tab A into slot B and stuff like that. So I had more creativity, but also that's also more just chaos to to wade through. Are they um, all like that though? I mean, what's your i do you, Do you ever I, have? Again, I don't have the longest resume to say like they're all like that. But in my but if you do three film editing um, career, since I've been working with indie film, which always doesn't have enough money, and like for instance, I'm always I've always been my own assistant editor, so I'm also like doing all the like boring organization and all that stuff. So it's like they're all. Um, I don't want to say disorganized, but they're all less than optimally like laid laid out. So and you're in- a filter for organization before you can even start. You have to sort of make sense of it or, or that, I mean, that's well, part of yeah, starting. You, that's you know, part of the, 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 again, no offense to the uh, DITs and the, on the sets of the films where I work, but there's a, each editor has his own way of working. So mm-hmm. um, I like to organize things in a certain way just to help keep track and make sense of like, what we were just talking about the chaos, the giant mound of spaghetti that I'm trying to like line up into neat rows. Um, and also, you know, you're working with less time to edit than you would want, you know, like you can't try every single possibility that's there. You kind of have to go with your gut and make sure things are good enough to move on. And then you come back and you say, well, this maybe can this be better. Um, and different directors work in different ways too. Some, like Larry trusted me. He's like, make a cut and then come to me and I'll say what I like or don't like about it. And in the end, that's the thing too, as an editor, it's not my final decision, how a scene goes. I sort of pitch everything and some pitches are accepted unconditionally. And for the most part, they're all tweaked to sort of say, okay, let's do this. Let's do that. And then there's a long process of even, even on an indie film, you know, you screen it for people, you say like, what did you get from this? What did you get from that? You can get interesting feedback from that that you can then actually use because you've been looking at it for so long. Um, so your original question was, do I get freaked out? Absolutely. You go just like, oh, yeah. here we go again. But it's also the fun part is like getting to play in that sandbox. Um, I, I've always been curious, Do Does the primary film editor uh, have anything to do with the trailers editing? Not usually. I've also actually edited trailers, and I think I've only once edited the film and the trailer. It was this low-budget movie that actually Larry Levine was in called Detonator, um, which was actually the first feature film I ever edited. Um, so have you seen a trailer where you were like... What the fuck Disappointed? Did yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I had a... After Black Bear, the film I edited after that was this um, sort of disappointing in the outcome horror film called Abandoned. And uh, the director was extremely, um, let's just say, marginalized by a really, well, basically gangster level set of producers. And that's a long mm-hmm. story. But um, so they, he had a lot of problems with a lot of the things that went on there. And then when we saw the trailer, we were just like, oh, my God, they give away everything in the movie in this trailer. And I think he and his agent were able to push back on it somewhat to sort of ameliorate the problem. But yeah, absolutely, because because trailers are marketing. They're not art. They're not even right. entertainment. They're simply selling the movie to the audience that they think they can manipulate into going to see it. So it's doing something completely different. But I've also had fun doing trailers, too. I, in fact, I edited trailers for Larry's previous couple of movies um, before we actually worked together as the editor on his feature film. So I've gotten to do some of that work. Uh, and yeah, it's but it's very different total different mindset let's talk some more about the uh film discussion class can so so you kind of describe that can you give like the official pitch or official pitch for that because i think more people need to sign up for it yeah definitely join us everybody within the sound of my voice in fact our new session is going to be starting up i think it starts the first week of june the link is not quite out yet 
But if you uh, come follow me on Twitter at Langdon Boom, which I think it's, yeah, it's, here it is. Um, yeah, and in the description of this podcast, everyone can find links to all of your stuff, including Common Points Queen. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's this place uh, out in Forest Hills that used to be like the JCC. Now they call it Common Point Queens. Um, and they're the people that run this class. And uh, every, you know, every Tuesday we meet at noon for an hour and a half to two hours. Usually it's two hours. Sometimes it even goes longer if people can hang. And, uh, you know, you have received a, a link to a film that I have chosen, which you get basically no heads up for what it is before you get it. And uh, you watch it in the week before the class. And then you come on at noon and we all have a a Zoom chat uh, to the extent that it can be a full conversation. I, I keep trying to make it so people can kind of talk to each other more than it's not just me and them and them and me. But um, we have a really interesting and always enlightening, often very insightful. Sometimes people share personal things and uh, we have very intelligent film type brains at work there who are uh, illuminating things that uh, we all benefit from, especially me. And we just have a good old down home, heavy work, heavy lifting film guy, film chat about these, you know, admittedly, sometimes totally confounding movies. Some of them are make more sense than others. Some of them are more emotionally uh, charged than others. Some are more intellectually taxing than others. Um, do you also have my uh, letterbox on there? Cause you can go and yeah. look, uh, the link, I have a link uh, to a letterbox list of all the movies I've ever shown in that class. So you can kind of get a taste for the method to the madness there, uh, such that there is one, you'll see some recurring filmmakers, people who's like entire bodies of work. I just eventually will see before I die. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of people like Hong Sang Su, um, Chantal Ackerman, we've seen a few. We talked about a pitch upon We're Us at the Cool. I think we saw every movie by Lucretia Martel. I think we saw almost every movie by Joanna Hogg. Just, uh, you know, I go back to certain wells, but I try to keep it, you know, if one week it was like really soul searing and, and deep and, and disturbing, next week maybe it's just like a like a British sort of kitchen sink type movie. But, you yeah. know, like I, I try to give a little bit of sense to the programming. A lot of people are like, can we have a shorter one next time? But I, I think there there are times where I'm watching the movie and I'm going, yeah, I mean, if and I like to challenge myself, but I'm thinking the discussion about this is what I'm really looking forward to. Like before the movie's even over, I'm like, this discussion is going to be great. Um, on yeah, that note, people, people have actually said the best compliment I've ever gotten uh, is I often hear, I didn't like the movie, but I loved the discussion. In the you're class. always going to love the discussion, always, yeah. hands down. And it's so fun to be involved in a discussion about any, any one movie, especially ones that I wouldn't naturally watch um, or, or know about, right? Um, but, but like... Um, I'm happy to hear you say that. Well, these folks are from all different walks of life. That's true, too. And, and so, like, in, in my day-to-day, -day, if somebody, you know, if movies come up, great. I can talk about movies. But if somebody tells me, like, randomly, like, oh, I, I thought that movie, quote-unquote, sucked, my first reaction is, who do you think you are <laughs> to deny the human experience in that curt <laughs> of a expression? Like, I can't stand it, right? But Yeah. But knowing that we're going to talk to, like, okay, we Suck watched... is a real conversation ender, right? There's nothing else to say. Yeah. <laughs> right. And and like I don't I don't know about you, but sometimes I accidentally feel like a movie snob because I'll judge people on what they don't like versus what they like. No, not me. Never. No. Oh really? Oh no. Not even like while you're talking, sometimes that's you're my like, whole, that's my, like that's a Michael snob. would say that's my core brand proposition sometimes yeah. is movie snob. So yeah, but I, I, I see what you're saying. You're literally judging their value morally is like you were just not the kind of person i want to know if you okay there are movies we were talking about you were talking about this earlier there are movies where it's like hey if you didn't like it sorry we tried we sure did get that box office though and and there's a lot of marketing on the front end there's other movies where if you don't like it but you know that it's renowned and it's like been renowned as a, a work of a great work of art for decades like you better look into that you better figure out that movie and why this is what i do personally and you know this about me i'm always like okay i didn't like it 
So then I really sat up and paid attention. And I might even go back and watch certain parts that I didn't get to be like, what, it, what am I missing? You know, and there was there was a movie, The Ascent, that Russian film. It was a World War II setting. Mm-hmm. Forget the mm-hmm. name of the director. It was a female director. Yeah, it came uh, out in 77, I think, yeah, right? It's um, uh, Lisa. Oh, I'm blanking on her name. Yeah. I will, probably wouldn't be able to pronounce it anyway. But um, but there was someone in the class who Shepitko. was talking about Shapitko, Alyssa Shapitko, Larissa Shapitko. Great. She the movie was fascinating, right? And and so it is heavy. And there was somebody in the class, and I, I don't want to, you know, talk about somebody's personal experience. It could but be they could, well, and I mean there are films that we'll talk about where somebody may relay a personal experience that occurred in the period of the period piece film we're watching, right? Yes. And for me, as and I'm just a bystander at that point. This is totally unexpected and so rewarding that I get to hear someone's personal experience because where else am I going to get that? Right, well, and like, that, that is you're you're sort of skirting around one of the, the the things is this this class actually started as an in person like adult education mostly for like retired seniors uh, kind of you know mental acuity kind of class something for them to do. Uh, in their you know golden years except for i kept showing these kinds of movies so the only people that would keep coming back were these like seriously deep people like you know what i'm saying they they are deep they yeah. really are and whether they talk about their experience the movie the process it's always insightful yeah so we have this great and now that it's been put on zoom we get people from all around the world so we have for instance people from switzerland people from canada people from all over the country so we've we've got a nice variety now but our sort of anchor were always these you know older adults who are you know have seen some shit in their lives and they've been film guys and gals from way back and yeah the the sort of the personal anecdotes is definitely one of those things that I'm just always I'm blown away by. It's almost it's almost like a group therapy session sometimes. You know, I try not to let it get too uh, far off the content of the movie, but I'm glad to hear that that is meaningful to you because uh, it it's something that I really uh, appreciate and enjoy about the class personally. Oh yeah, I mean that's it's. I mean, if you're gonna have a discussion with people you know, it's got to be a good fit. And for me, I always appreciate when, like if it was just a bunch of people like me, I kind of know how that's going to go, right? I don't need to be in that discussion. And Um, and also like, I've never presented the class as like some really highfalutin academic like insight. Like I don't bring theory too much. I do a little bit, you know, because again, I'm not an academic either. I'm a film guy, you know, so I'm not trying to get it too theoretical and too dry. Like I like to keep it personal and to talk about these things, not as a just sort of, again, as an academic issue, but as like how they actually can affect our lives and what they mean to us. And, and uh, so, you know, I kind of try to keep it on that level too. So it, I think it, maybe encourages people to share that kind of stuff more. But then sometimes people have some really interesting like theories and sort of, uh, you know, sort of more of an, in a critical lens of the meaning of the films and stuff like that. So we sort of get all kinds of good stuff. Yeah. It's a real viewer oriented discussion, but you give a lot of background to the film and you provide like um, reviews or essays about the film or the director and and then people are always like oh i found an interview and they'll link everyone people up tell to me that. things and you you're one of the people that sometimes they'll bring things i'm like oh i didn't even know that i didn't look that up with a guy you know i uh, to me it's like to me the skill is like h- how are we um learning to first see what our own reactions are to the movie right like that's the first bit of information before we make a meaning out of our you know uh experience how do we get in touch with the experience and see like how what what how sensitive are we to what we saw and that it's not that's sort of like a muscle that's not necessarily something you read in a book you do that by watching the movies and just sort of getting used to sort of noticing the way you react to movies like for instance when you said like 
oh, the discussion is going to be great on this one. Like something was happening to you in that moment that you're just like, oh, that something went off in my head. So, you know, none of that is necessarily doesn't require a advanced degree or, or, or sort of, a, you know, background in semiotics or something like that. So I, I try to keep it that way. But it does help sometimes to read what some critics have written and, you know, reviewers or critics, you know, I kind of make a distinction. And uh, so I provide a little bit of that. But also I try not to look too much into it myself just so I'm not too um, tainted or prejudiced to the movie one way or the other before I've seen it. I mean, that stuff is cool because you'll learn little details and then you'll look that up. And there was the one movie, I totally forget the name of it, but I found out like, oh, those two actors were really having a love affair offset. And then one died and the director held the other guy to gunpoint at the funeral. And you're like, that's not the movie. That's all happened after the movie, <laughs> you know? So yeah. anyway. You provide your own DVD bonus features. That's cool too. Yeah. So if let's assume like your livelihood didn't didn't depend on it what is this what you want to do for a living between editing and uh um having your film discussion class or or is there any other thing like i always say i want to sing and dance i want what do you what do you want to do is there anything yeah no being a film editor that's you know, I nobody goes to film school saying like I want to be an editor. You know, everyone wants to be a director or a screenwriter, and that's how I started out too. And uh, I enjoyed writing scripts, and I enjoyed uh, also when I came to New York, I did a lot of uh, writer and director and, and actor workshops with this guy Tom Noonan, another guy that Ray Carney hooked me up with around the same time I worked with uh, Sam, and I just had basically the time of my life and learned so much about all the arts that go into making movies um so i have a great love of that and if like if somebody said to me here's a billion dollars make whatever movie you want to make i would probably do that too but as far as i'm concerned being a film editor it's like the best of both worlds you get to have the sort of creative experience of you know what they call the seventh art like really editing is its own it's the most unique part of filmmaking right because every other aspect, photography, lighting, drama, script, all these things, acting, they all exist in some other art form too, painting or theater or so on. Um, So editing is like the quintessential thing about being a filmmaker. And yet it's, it's not like, as we said, it's not no stress, but it's way less stress than what the director is dealing with. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of found that it's this great niche. And plus I get to collaborate with hopefully somebody that you really respect and is fun, you know, as a director. So, and like with Larry, it was like a dream scenario. So for me, editing is like the sweet spot. And uh, I'm very happy to do my best to make a career as an editor, which, you know, even that's not a given. This is very uh, sort of um, tangential uh, career path in and of itself. But so, yeah, editing, that's uh, that's definitely where my passion is lying. I love that. I I love when people answer that question. Cause I ask everybody, I love when they answer like, this is what I should be doing. That's it's your calling. Um, is there, um, is another like, Oh, I always wonder this. Are, are you privy to a movie soundtrack during the editing process or like a score or anything like that? Do you get the music? Cause I, I assume like if there's a key scene and they're like, all right, this is the song you gotta know this. Right. But like, how often does that happen? Well, some movies, yes. And some movies, no. Like the last movie I just uh, was an editor on, the director was very much like, this is the song that's going to be in the scene. And we got the rights already because I already knew when I wrote the script that this is going to be the song. So here it is. Um, but that's not always the case. It's In fact, it's usually not the case. Um, like for Black Bear, we just use a lot of temp music. And like Larry and I played around with different soundtracks and different bands and things like that to sort of make the temp soundtrack work. But, excuse me, at a certain point, then the the, the composer does come on um, somewhere around the middle of your editing. Um, and sometimes they'll start to furnish you with like, you know, close to the finished tracks. Now it, it sort of was a real special, um, like great privilege uh, in a special case that Larry brought me into the sound mix and really even the sound edit um, because we were so sort of closely aligned on what all everything was and, and also, like, I think Larry trusted, like, sort of my technical head, too, mm-hmm. to keep things straight. Um, so I wound up being in the mixing theater with him for both the sound mix and the color correction, which normally an editor is not. The, the editor delivers the cut and 
the director goes off with the other collaborators and does that. But in that sense, I got to really like to the point where, you know, the, the composer and, and the genius composers on Black Bear um, I, are just, I cannot say enough about them. If you want to go hear an awesome soundtrack, the Black Bear soundtrack is available on iTunes and it's so good. And those guys are really geniuses. Um, they deliver the soundtrack in stems, you know what I mean? Where here's the drums, here's the timpani, you know, or here's the, those are both drums, but here's the piano and here's the strings. And we were even getting to play with like, oh, I, there's too much of this. Like, take this down. Like, so oh, we were wow. we were both getting to really, you know, like I said, it's like it's too full. Like, take you know, maybe they doesn't need the bassoon, you know, whatever it is. You know, they did all kinds of different instruments. So I really got to get into the nitty gritty of that, which is um, highly unusual. But it just speaks to the nature of Larry and my uh, close sort of working relationship. I, uh, I think I think you can feel the. Um like the amount of attention and care that goes into a movie, especially on that one, that movie had my head spinning. I was going in every direction. By the end, I was like worn out. <laughs> Did you say, like really this tired. is going to be a great discussion. Oh wait, we're not in the class. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, do you have a all time favorite editor? Somebody that you admire or inspire? It's a you? sad fact of the matter. is that the editors are sort of the unsung people. Mm. Um, and it's not like I grew up thinking like, I mean, you you mentioned Thelma Schoonmacher. She's just famous, really, because she's Scorsese. been Martin, Martin Scorsese's editor for many years. Or, you know, Verna Fields was very famous because she Sally Mink. She told um, uh, Spielberg that shark looks fucking fake. We're going to we're not going to use that, you know, like right. genius. Uh, yes, yeah, Sally Menke, rest her soul. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. these people who have been collaborators with the director who is really well known. So. Yeah, I can't say. It's hard for me to even say, like, ooh, that looks like Sally's editing. You know, it's like, it's very yeah. um, contingent on the director. And, and you just named, like, auteurs, too, who, like, have their own style. So they're there to serve that vision for the most part. Because the real test would be, like, show me the Reservoir Dogs raw footage, and now let me see. <laughs> like, you know, like, right. it's very hard to sort of reverse engineer and say, like, Oh, that was the editor who clearly did that. Occasionally, mm. you're like, "Ooh, that's interesting." But you know, there's the famous story of Godard and how he sort of invented the jump cut. It was just because he didn't know what he was doing, and the uh, a producer uh, friend told him the movie's too long. You should just cut out some scenes. He's like, "I'm not going to oh. cut out scenes. I'm just going to cut out stuff from the middle just to make it shorter." And sort of he had that kind of a situationist huh. kind of feel to it, which is you know before I guess those guys, but. He's and it, well, voila, it's an interesting new technique he invented. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. Um, okay, we've been talking about movies. Do you want to talk about some specific movies? I'm gonna throw you a curveball. Sure, well, uh, you know, I've got you, you want like my top 40 favorite. No, <laughs> I'm gonna, movies. I thought, oh, I you want to, okay, speed yeah, round. since. Go. Since I haven't been in the class, I thought what I would do is just read off the movies I've been watching. And you can either just okay. I'm just gonna go like this. Yeah. Like <laughs> if you want to talk about them, we can. Maybe there's something here you haven't seen. I don't Do know. I thought that would be interesting. I, I'll listen to you talk. But yeah, go ahead. Well, some of them. I mean, are some you not of them, on Letterboxd? You should be on Letterboxd. Nah, I'm not. Yeah, I don't know. That's like the one thing that it would just be t too much. That'd be yeah. the straw, you know. And but, let me just warn people: you start to be like. You're thinking like um, about the conversation. I'm thinking, what am I going to write a letter about? It's still the halfway through right. the movie, you know. Yeah. Like, no. I used to review comic books, and that happened, and I had to stop. I stopped for a few reasons, but that one in particular. Um, and also, it got to the point where I could review the comic and then read it, and I was like, "This is bad. It's just a well, formula now." Yeah, that is so, uh, this. That's more of a more of a criticism of like journalism, arts yeah. journalism than, than anything else. But yeah, I, I, I sometimes I go like, is this a three star movie or a four star? Shut up. It's still going, you know? Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. I just want to enjoy it. Um, okay. How about this? Ashes and diamonds. By oh yeah. We actually showed that in an earlier Andre version of the Biden. class. Oh, you did. Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. And I, I, and I want to show more. I'm not going to say his name, right? That's Vida. Vida. Andre Vida. Vida. Um, I'm, I want to see more of his movies and more just Polish movies in general. Um, we just recently saw Watch the Kieslowski. I never saw uh, Camera Buff, which was awesome. Um, you know how but, I heard about Ashes and Diamonds? Um, do you watch Barry with Bill Hader? 
Absolutely. He, he's so he's guy. he's directing the whole fourth and final um, season. And someone asked him in an interview, and he seemed real rushed, like he didn't want to be in the interview. And he goes, just watch the opening scene from that movie, Ashes and Diamonds, if you want to know what I'm trying to do as a director. And so I did. And of course, I watched like the entire thing. It's it's a, it's fantastic. Any Barry fan yeah. needs to stop and watch that movie. Yeah. Um, well, Hater is okay. a huge film guy. You know, they did yeah. documentary now and all that yeah. stuff. Went to film school. That was always his thing. And that's you can definitely feel that in what he's doing in Barry. I just started the new season of documentary now. It's really good. Um, okay. Yeah. In, Inherent Vice, P.T. Anderson. What do you think? No. I, I was had, a fan of the book by Thomas Pinchon. Okay. See, now, here's one of those things what you brought up earlier, which I, I would have maybe made this tributary off of that conversation had we been able to. But pa Paul Thomas Anderson, I'm like the world's least fan of Paul yeah. Thomas Anderson. I've never, like, hated any of his movies, really. Although Punch Truck Love, I actually kind of hated. Um, but I've always sort of, like, oh, yeah, it was good. But that one I particularly didn't really like to me he feels like a like when people say film bro like hmm. that's sort of the the vibe that i get off of him but you know it's because he, he wants to be a scorsese or a 70s type guy but i just don't i don't feel his soul i don't he, like he's very technically proficient and he, he kind of quotes all the things that i also like so it's kind of interesting in that way but it just felt it feels um well i hate to use the word go ahead pretentious it just feels like a guy trying to be great but just i don't want what are we doing here I, it, it's sort of a, a just another genre remix and then and not quite as ballsy as like a tarantino it's just sort of more like laid back um but actually i'll tell you the movie of his i actually really like a lot like love was the master mm. um, and th that's because that one felt like more personal in some way it mm -hmm. felt less articulate I guess it like it was more confusing in a great way, like very mysterious, not just like a mystery that will get revealed by the end. Like, Oh, it was, but um, yeah, I can't say I love his movies and to be honest, well, your advice maybe is one of my least favorite, but he nailed the adaptation though. <laughs> That's it's really funny because like I'm a Thomas Pinchon fan. And so then when I was like, Oh, he's making that movie. He's going to ruin that. And I was like, no, Great, great adaptation. <laughs> I like it. Well, I, maybe it makes more sense to, um, you know, the the sort of um, wackiness or whatever, like the sort of like I don't know what you want to call it. Like uh, it's a comedy. The yeah. book is a comedy. Yeah, and and the sort of a non sequitur kind of, um, you know, uh, I guess it's like it's not psychedelic, but. Um, just it's it's wackiness just felt kind of forced mm. to me but maybe it, having the background of the book would have helped it feel more grounded. maybe well okay um let's move on the american friend vim vendors i saw that in film school and it's oh, been really? a fucking long time yeah I, i've I seen it before vendors, but you loved it uh i don't know it's a weird movie it was uh dennis hopper right out of rehab yeah. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I thought there's moments that were I'm just I'm just reading off a list of movies I've watched recently. That's cool. You're going through some I mean, not necessarily because I liked them, but I saw it one time years ago and just didn't remember it. So I wanted to watch it again. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. The movie. I'm also but not anyway. a huge Vim Vendors fan, although yeah. again, I, I like consume them all on VHS in the mid nineties. So yeah. like, you know, I, the ones that stuck with me were wings of desire, which, which I want to watch again in like a new transfer. It's the new age to see it. Cause it was beautiful imagery, but I watched it on a, you know, 480 TV set and Paris, Texas. Cause that was a, um, Sam Shepard, uh, who I also loved. So those are the two that stick with me, but I, I watched almost all the other ones up until that point. Hmm. Um, the wizard of Oz. Uh, what's that? I never just like a weirdly perfect movie. Every time, every never time I'm flipping through my DVDs, I'm like, I'll oh, watch that again. It's just good to have on. I don't know why it brings out the kid in me. I think. 
yeah, it's just uh, everything that was, uh, you know, yeah, enjoyable about Hollywood of the 30s. And, you know, if you believe the uh, monetary, monetary theory people, it's a, it's a metaphor for the gold standard and so on. You yeah. Heard that one? yeah. Um, there's a lot of stuff about that movie. It, it does work with the first half works with the dark side of the moon, but I don't know if you've ever done yeah. that. It does. It weird. Yeah. It's weird how it fits, I've, but I've heard that. I've heard that you got to start it right when the lion roars. And yeah. yeah. So I just watched stand by me, Rob Reiner. Oh 1986. yeah. Pukerama. <laughs> a girl, a girl walks home alone at night. That is on my short list. I've even and thought of maybe lady. bringing that to the class because it's sort of genre y but also kind of arty. Yeah, and great soundtrack because there's a lot of Iranian music mm-hmm. in that. That I, it, I it, it is it is an American movie though, right? But she's like no. an Iranian American. It's no? an Iranian vampire western. I think is okay, how they. But I thought the filmmaker was actually American, just in doing a Persian movie. But no, it's produced by Elijah Wood's film company. But I'm pretty sure she's Iranian. I don't know. Maybe yeah. I'm wrong. I I, I seem to remember it being like a big deal that she was doing it there. Yeah. But um, I love Iranian movies in general. So, Friends of Eddie Coyle. Oh uh, yeah, that's Peter Yates. I, As, you know, that's it's not like. After you've seen the real core, like ten or fifteen, that's in like the next ten or fifteen. Yeah, yeah. Seventies. It's it's good, but it's you just gotta. It's look at this point. I just love hanging out in a seventies movie. I just yeah. want to go in the bars. I just want to ride in the cabs. Yeah. I just want to walk in the su- the subway. You know. That one was gritty, right? Gritty. gritty. In Boston. Yeah, and look, anything with Peter Boyle, I am a hundred percent in, especially when he's being shitty. Yeah, um, he's the double crosser. Yeah. So, spoiler alert. That was yeah. a Oh, yeah, we're spoiling everything. That was a George V Higgins book. Um and I was a fan of his. He was like a I think he was a politician but also a lawyer and a professor and then turned crime writer. Okay. Did you ever see Killing Them Softly with Brad Pitt? I never did, but I do recall the title. That, that was another Higgins book. Um so again, I read the books and then I said, oh, they made a movie out of this one. Robert Mitchum is great. And I think that's where the nickname Knuckles comes from. I don't want to spoil that for people. I don't remember that. No, okay. Yeah, they called him that because he owed money and they slammed his hand in the dresser drawer and broke his knuckles. Right. Um, Bone Tomahawk. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Uh, I forget who it was on the Majority Report recommended that I start watching his all of his movies. Nah, I don't know about all of them. Well, Zayler, I've, seen two, I've seen two, and they've both, like, grossed me out. Like, I, I, I just, um... Yeah. Like, okay, like, he's a Tarantino next generation, uh, you know... Uh, you know, and yes, okay, the, 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 the Tarantino sort of violence, but with some comedy... Um, it's it's not really it's not really my bag. It's it yeah. is one of those movies where you're like watching the whole time, but then like when it goes like super gory, mm-hmm. uh, I'm just like this is just um gr- gratuitous, right? Yeah, to use the word. it's like the final act is just yeah nasty. Uh, okay, wait here, wait, but I'll I've got my um this is my letterbox review. I gave it two and a half stars, which is okay. doesn't doesn't mean I didn't like it, right? It was like two and a half stars. It's not zero. I wrote, interesting idea for a Western. The Hills Have Eyes meets The Searchers. Marred by the attempt to elevate itself with Pulp Fiction-esque, anachronistic, banal but witty conversations, punctuated by extreme violence and gore. Actually, that's what I remember now, is they're all trying to talk in that witty, His Girl Friday, rip-off of a rip-off Tarantino kind of language. And that just, this just like turns my stomach. Uh, not as mean spirited yeah. ultimately as I was expecting, and definitely scary at times, boring at others. So, overall, a satisfying modern entry in the genre. So, that's a pretty decent review. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. No, I, I feel the same way. When I first saw it, I was like, that was great. And the next time I saw it, I was like, I don't know. Uh, Kurt Russell well, was okay. Uh, I can still, like, here's the thing I can still become a 14 year old boy in plenty yeah. of ways. There's there is a thing where now that I'm older, 
like I don't know, once I hit like my 30s, violence, gore was no longer funny. Like I was like, ooh, that could really happen to me. So like I oh, used yeah. to love, you know, like mm -hmm. Evil Dead and Harold and Maude was like one of my early f favorite movies. And, you know, the movies I was making in the backyard were chopping hands off and heads off and, you know, blood and splatter and all this Monty Python kind of hilarious violence. And it was so funny. And occasionally <laughs> I can find that funny still. But like these days, anything that's really violent and gory, I'm just like, oh, my God, like. Like I watched some of the hostile movies and like I literally almost couldn't finish it. Like it took every ounce of my film yeah. education to get through it. It's hard for me to do horror now. And just like the the, the torture porn, that kind of horror, you know, like the well, real violent stuff. Yeah. So Bon Tomahawk sort of had some of that. I, I brought this up when we were talking about that Thai film. What was it called again? Cemetery, Cemetery of Splendor. Yeah. So there were some supernatural elements to that that happened very casually in the daytime <laughs> outside yeah. and yeah. that to me is the scariest thing like yes. my that. the scariest thing that could happen is everyone's just hanging out at a barbecue like a family barbecue and someone yeah, shows yeah, up and we yeah. all know they passed away a long time ago but they're there that is freaky to me okay so yeah. the next movie i saw was called un profit uh, what it's french you, uh, it just cut translates out Oh, it translates to a prophet, un prophet. Oh, okay, yeah, I've um, I've had that on my list uh, of movies to see too. That's um, pretty good. Uh, was... Audiard. Yes, it was. Uh, it was nominated for um, best foreign film at the Oscars in I think two thousand nine. It lost to Secret in Their Eyes, which was very good Spanish film. Have you seen that? No. They remade it. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, it was uh, Julia Roberts remade it in, in America. It It's not as good as the, uh, I think it was Spanish, but that's a great one. Um, How was A Prophet? I think it's awesome. It's like a gangster prison movie. Like a young kid goes to prison and you see his like rise. Mm, interesting. Yeah, it was good. People said, oh, it's like the new Godfather, which it wasn't, but. It was really I've, in any of his crazy. movies. He's he's a more of a, you know, like a sort of a French Tarantino ish type guy. Yeah. Um, here I'm going to cruise through these. The Men, Marlon Brando's first movie. Oh, never saw that one. Fred Zinnemann. Okay. Wow. So 1950. He plays a paraplegic, like first movie Brando ever did, and he's. In, he's either like in in bed it, it it's like I'm a sure he had to really compete for that role he was amazing he killed it it was great it, it the whole thing takes place in this rehab hospital for world world war world war ii veterans who are all paraplegic and for him to like do you know that's usually a movie somebody does down the line right like oh i'm really going to test myself now and do one where i'm in yeah, bed Daniel or Day -Lewis. Day -Lewis. Right, exactly. Yeah, it was great. It it was fantastic. I totally recommend it. It was a Going great movie. List. Um, and that's the same director who did Oklahoma, which is another favorite. Of mine. Oh, really? Yeah, what? and High, High Noon. Noon. High Noon yeah. is a big one, or for here, yeah. from here to eternity. Mm -hmm. That's a good one too. But uh, Barbarian Sound Studio. No, Peter Strickland. Who? Uh, it it's directed by Peter Strickland, starring Toby Jones from 2012, and it is about a movie sound effect guy. And they never show you the movie, <laughs> but it is. Um, uh, what, what era are we talking here, and what country? It's ah, uh, so he's he's working for. God, this was like a few weeks ago. Okay. Um, See, this is what Letterbox is good for. You just look and you go like, oh yeah, that. Yeah, it's it, he it yeah, it's a good question. I want to say it was like the 60s or something, but the movie it's like a horror movie and it's very grotesque. And the director is very like intense about I, I'm trying not to ruin it for you. The director is okay. like Hey, you said it, I will put it on the uh the good old list. It's an emotional roller coaster for the sound effects guy. And you can tell from the things he's using to make the sound effects, uh -huh. like the movie must be horrible. Okay. Like, and we were talking about violent horror movies, so it's kind of. Did you relevant. ever see Blowout, the uh, De Palma movie yeah. with Travolta, yeah, yeah. where he's going around looking for the right sound until mm -hmm. the end? 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Classic. Uh, Hustle and Flow. That's um, Craig Brewer, 2005. Did I see that actually? Uh, it takes place in Memphis. It's about. Um, oh, it's like rappers? A, yeah, it's a pimp who decides to be a rapper. Yeah. No, I didn't see that. Yeah. It was okay for an independent film. Okay. Um, low budget. Uh, uh-huh. Pig, starring Nicolas Cage. No, that's definitely on my list, though, since it came out maybe a year or so ago. I've heard good things. I'm not going to say anything else about it. Okay, don't say anything. That'll do, Pig. That'll do, Pig. Yeah. Uh, Akira. Oh, the anime. The anime. Yeah, Yeah. of course. I mean, I saw that, again, on VHS and whatever, 1991 or something. But I just got a huge, the biggest TV I've ever had, so I'm like going back and watching big stuff. Uh, (laughs) And I started with Akira. Um, what, uh, let's talk inches here. What do you got? Uh, what was it? Uh, 67. Is that right? Okay. Like any TV can be widescreen if you sit close enough. So that's all I saw. Well, I renovated the basement. Oh, and nice. So Man I cave. made, yeah, dude, I got several feet of bookshelves full of comics, nice. DVDs. It's awesome. Nice. You should come over and hang out. Um, where, where do you live again? South Carolina. You probably do, shouldn't yeah, come over. <laughs> Occasionally, if I'm driving through to Florida, sometimes where my mom lives, so yeah. maybe I'll hop out sometime. Yeah, detour. Uh, blast of silence. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, now, I don't love the whole movie, but the guy, mm-hmm. the fat guy who plays the like the sweaty uh, like antagonist guy, like it, that performance is one of those just like all the great all time performances. It, like he doesn't. It's like who told him to do that? Like he he he's unlike any other performance I've ever seen in, in a movie before. Like that, the movie is a little sort of like creaky in, in terms of its like you know low budget charm versus yeah. like uh, you know interest. But that that guy's uh, performance uh, he, in, in the first scene in his apartment, like oh my god, that that's not the guy from Shock Corridor, is it? Is it? Hmm. That's another one I haven't seen in. I don't a think long, it is. Long time. Yeah, me neither. Who is that? Sam Fuller. Sam Fuller directed that one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, it is him. It is him. It is. I checked. Yep. Oh wow. There you go. Wow. Geek points. I, I definitely. I owe shot corner wow. another view. Yeah, me too. Uh, North You've by North. like five movies. Yeah, go ahead. North by Northwest. Never heard of it. <laughs> okay. I I'm won't. like, I'm like, this is another point of contention for me. Like, I, I've never seen a Hitchcock movie I didn't enjoy. Yeah. But like, I just don't think he's like, I've seen so many other movies that are so much deeper, better. Like, if, if people said he was like the greatest entertainer of all time, I would be like, yes, absolutely. Because you're always just like, ah, what's going to happen? How's it going to go? You know, but people say he's just the great supreme cinema artist. And I'm just like, you've never seen enough picture pong we're also at the cool movie like i mean there's all there's so many people that have taken the medium in a much more um i don't want to say like mature but mature direction you know like deep like it's not just entertainment it's not just how many ways can you be gripped to the screen you know and and like the reptilian brainstem he's a genius at the reptilian brain um mm-hmm. and yes he has like a level of intelligence more than just your average like afternoon cereal or whatever at the time you know just like pure just genre trash of course uh he's intelligent and, and a master craftsman but i was like i can't get too excited about hitchcock maybe it's I, it was spoon-fed to me at school i don't know i keep saying i want comic book adaptations that take place in the year they debuted so like i want like a 1938 superman movie and That'd i want awesome. it to look like north by northwest Cause wouldn't it be cool if like he was Superman and like when the planes coming after him, like he just turned into super, I don't know. I think, I think you could awesome. probably ask an AI to do that now. Just uh Hey, uh, yeah. chat, give me the uh, North by Northwest Superman. I mean, you get close to it with the old George Reeves TV show, but yeah. Or those old <laughs> animations. Yeah. Um, yeah. The Fleischer uh, raising Arizona. No, the Golden Brothers. It's like my go to rewatch. Right. Yeah, that's I'm never not laughing at that movie. Yeah. Uh, actually, I had like a I had like an on again, off again love affair with the Coen brothers. Like, because when I, you know, this is just maybe a sidebar to, to just get to the Coen brothers, but 
I, like I told you about my uncle who, when I was 13 said, Oh, you want to be a movie director? Well, like I had no idea even what it was. He's like, well, go watch taxi driver, raging bull, you know, life of Brian, Harold and Maud. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of what else he, other, some other more, more recent ones at close range. He like gave me a series of like movies that weren't like super obscure, but were like the, the kind of like intelligent 70s cinema. And then I went to summer camp and I met, like my uncle is, you know, 28 years older than me. I met kids that were like 10 years older than me. And they were like, oh, well, you should go see Jim Jarmusch and John Waters and the Coen brothers. So then when I started to watch those, I must have been 17 or 18. I was just like, oh, my God. Like, uh, you know, I guess it was uh, I think the first one I ever saw. Actually, Barton Fink was in the theaters when I was a teenager and I worked at the theater. So I think I saw that one first. But then I went back and saw all of them. Uh, and I even made a parody with Camp Kids of, um, um, you know, what's the gangster of the 20s gangster movie, Miller's Crossing. So oh. I had a real uh, obsession. You I wrote did? Wow. Yeah. And that's somewhere on YouTube and very, very low res. But it was like, you know, the kids oh. can act and I was waving a video camera around and they're playing like gangsters and they're all eight and 12. And <laughs> But anyway, I so I love the Coen brothers for the longest time and, and Raising Arizona. I mean, yeah, that's just like eminently quotable, hilarious movie. Um, but then I sort of got away from like I got went to film school. I started seeing all these more, you know, uh, like Cassavetes and Mike Lee and Ozu and all these things. And I just started to say like, oh, well, they he left all that behind, you know, like uh, this is so much deeper and so on. But then like something happened. Uh, I don't know. I got out of school and I started seeing some of them. I like I skipped like most of their like midnight after Fargo. I don't think I saw a movie of theirs for five or six years and they made like four or five. Um, but I'll always have a real place in my heart for those first like four Coen brother movies. I'll tell you, I'll tell you why I rewatched that because the movie I watched right before that was my dinner with Andre <laughs> and he talks yeah. about eating sand and it reminded me of that oh, scene yeah. where the guy's like, and when there was no crawfish to be found, we ate sand. He's like, what's that you say? He's like, we ate sand. He said, you ate sand? <laughs> That's, yeah. I love that. Um, okay, so my dinner with Andre. <laughs> so, I love I love that movie. That, I, that's, that's a weirdly still prescient movie about urban ennui and disconnect of media and all these things. So that's... Say I don't that know, again? Like, urban... Ennui, you know, just like being disconnected, like living in a city and being am amongst a million people and yet still just feeling empty and hollow and disconnected. You know, he's, I think I can't remember the exact words, but he's like talking about, like, I just go back to my apartment and I just stare at the wall or I read the newspaper, watch TV, you know, like, why don't we talk to each other? Why don't we ever have a, a you know, these, these connections? And this was 1980 or something. So yeah. it's like he didn't have... 5,000 streaming channels and every movie ever made available to his fingertips. So, um, I okay. I, so I'm watching this movie and, and I'm like, this discussion is going to be great. Who in the hell funded this? Like, what is, why is this a thing? What is this guy talking? He'll go on talking for like 10 minutes. Then they turn to Wallace Shawn and he goes, huh? And then they go back to the other guy for like another 10 <laughs> minutes. And so, you know, it's like, I can't believe somebody wrote this, much less memorized it all, right? Like, some of it's got to be true. And and so, you know, I'm I'm thinking of all this stuff, and then I'm like, oh, I'm not paying attention. I go back and, and start, like, a scene over, or or uh, not a scene, because it's all basically just one right. scene. But a chunk. here's what really got me. All the stuff going on in the restaurant around them. Like, those are all extras. Yeah. They aren't. They weren't really there sure. having dinner, right? Because that was the you most know, authentic a, part of the whole thing. It was thing. very low budget movie for the time, but I don't think it was that low budget that they're just like trying to pull off a, a movie shoot in the middle of a restaurant. I was blown away by the background and all the 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 um service guys who were working like right over his shoulder, you know, like making yeah. drinks and like preparing. It's like those people that... hated it the most. <laughs> So that movie was hard for me to watch, but I really appreciated I it because we already watched um, Vanya. Uh, what What's the... Yeah, Vanya on 42nd Street. On 42nd Street, right. So that was like, oh, okay, I get this. I know what this is, right? Like, oh, it, yeah. 
it meant was, it meant more their, the reunion movie basically well and so now there's like a third one out there called master and builder where they talk about this stuff is that yeah. right is that more of a documentary yeah i well again was this a documentary was vanya a documentary i think it's right got some okay of that, um to it but i have yet to see that one well now i'm interested in seeing it and next on my list that i haven't watched yet is wake in fright oh yeah uh i feel like australia i feel like i oh yes um supposedly very strange movie yeah. i mean i think i saw it once before but it's completely gone um i know that's been on my list yeah no i saw it uh see this is what this is what oh, yeah. it's good for yeah i saw it two again two and a half stars Ooh. intriguing ride for four fifths of the film but then seems to paint itself into a corner with nowhere to go threatens <laughs> to become something very interesting in the city mouse country mouse thriller vein before its first and fatal false move and never quite pays off absolutely dr star for animal violence as well i don't care if they oh. were professionals it was horrifying and disgusting for all the wrong reasons thankfully i can't remember what the animal violence was in that but whenever i see actual animals being uh hurt, should i skip it is there something i should watch instead oh yeah anything else is oh, come on man give me like a legit <laughs> Oh, you want a recommendation? Wait, so I thought you were yeah. reading the movies that you had seen. This is that's just the, on that's list. it, man. That's I've been too busy. That's all I've watched. No, that's a lot. That's plenty um, for like a few weeks. Yeah, it's a lot. Uh, let's see. Well, we what we just watched in the class. I can give you one of the for you know insights into what you've missed. We watched a, a great movie from the what they're considering the Romanian New Wave. It's extremely gripping harrowing it's got that kind of it almost is a great example of what we were sort of starting off the conversation with a movie that has like a seriousness to it not like a super spiritual depth but like a very honest drama side to it not just exploitative to keep you gripped and yet uh -huh. it is gripping and so the reptilian brain is turned on um but it's also not like gratuitously just trying to shock you for shock's sake it's it's very much like a a thriller but like with no like sort of um cliche kind of events of a thriller and maybe i won't even say well it, it's i guess you kind of know going into it but it's called four months three weeks and two days and it takes place in communist romania um it was made in 2007 but it takes place in the 80s and it's about a, a woman trying to help her friend get an illegal abortion and they have to like run from you know cops and and authorities and uh, deal with the back alley abortionists and all these things that are very just like <sighs> wow um, it's what still year? in the neo-realist vein what's that what year 2007 it came out okay but yeah that's it's definitely not light viewing it's not relax and crack a beer and sit back on a friday night but it is uh i, I thought it was amazing well a notice little, little surfacey but like I, I definitely it's it's so worth seeing notice how i watch like Totally unrelated movies, one after another. Do you do that, or do you have to? Because that in my hometown there was oh, a yeah. DJ who would always play like a song, and he'd say, "And one of the roadies was also a roadie for this band," and there always had to be like a connection oh, for his yeah. entire thing, you know. Uh, no, sometimes I'll find myself in that vein of like, "Well, I saw this. Let me see another movie with this guy or this director." But no, I, I mean, I literally have a watch list on letterbox that's like over 3000 movies like it may wow. take me 15 years to see them all if i would just started now wow um, so it's a combination of you know you get on jags or you know you feel like switching something up or you know somebody says something some random i have so many movies that like you said that about the the, the men i'm like okay yeah i want to see that i'll check that out so maybe that moves up the list you know um and, you know, there's directors, like I mentioned, that I want to just see everything they've ever made eventually. So I'm working my way slowly through all of Hong sang Su, all of Chantal Ackerman, all of, um, I forget who else we were talking about before. Uh, we are also at the cool. Um, so it's, yeah. But if you look at my, again, letterbox, my diary, you'll see it's like, um, I mean, I guess sometimes it's weird. Like, you know, it could go from like, uh, a we're off the cool to the latest Marvel movie. You know, it depends on what's going on here. But 
Um, I'd rather just be in the class. I mean, I'm linking up to the letterbox for sure, but I'd rather be in the class. And don't sure. let me miss out. You said June first it starts. That's like, um, yeah, it's or June sixth. I think the first class would be June sixth. Okay, so it's in two weeks from tomorrow. I'm back. Um, if, you're, if you're on the email list, you'll get the email. Great. Okay. Uh, okay. So I recommend everyone do that and hit all the links for Matthew and check out his stuff. And this is the first time I've had somebody on with the same name as me. Do you know what Matthew means? It's like I, God's gift. I always remind my wife. <laughs> yeah. God's gift, gift over here. From God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, I always end these interviews. Requ- can, can we uh, so- both be God's gift, though? Is mm, how many is he giving everybody the same gift? It doesn't yeah. seem. Yeah, dude, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not the only one. That's a little too right. Uh, egotistical. I mean, one of us <laughs> maybe is. The one. I'm not saying it's me or you. But one of there's a million Matthews. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and my mom hated that people would call me Matt, and so I she did. started calling me Hugh. <laughs> And Huey and stuff like that. And I was like, ah, oh, please don't do that. But it is true that I'll say, hi, my name's Matthew. And they go, hey, Matt. You and I, I was going to, I always say it's the last acceptable prejudice is to just assume that you can call a Matthew Matt. Like, what's yeah. your name, Matthew? Nice to meet you, Matt. Like, and Maddie. I get a lot of Maddie. Thankfully, I don't get too much of that, but I mm-hmm. have before. But yeah, my family always called me Matthew. But in high school and school, all my friends know me as Matt because it was like the teacher said Matt and I would just be like, okay, you know, so for years until I went to basically college or actually even left college, did I say yeah. like, mm, refer to me as Matthew. Yeah, that's, it's your right, man. <laughs> I know. It was hard to do though. It was like, I hate to have to do that. But uh, You could just say my mother prefers Matthew. That's what <laughs> yeah, I used to do. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. That's- so I always recommend comics to my guests. And this is this was tough for me because I know that you've read comics. Like you were a serious collector. But not in since like 30 years almost. Comics don't have a shelf life. I just mean I don't know. Like if anything new or good has come out in the last 30 years. I feel actually I've gone back and filled in some gaps. Um, now that I can like buy them digitally and put them on the iPad. Uh, that's opened up the world of comic books. Okay, this... This is from a while ago, but it's uh, European. So I'm trying to recommend something that you haven't read or that you wouldn't naturally gravitate toward. <laughs> but there's a there's like a film element. So you know Alejandro Jodorowsky. Yes. El Topo. Is this like the in Inui in Inu something? Wait. T- uh, it it, it's called the Meta Barons. Oh, okay, the Meta Barons. No. Yeah, you're thinking of um. Oh, what's it called? You know what I'm talking about, though. Yeah, with Mobius. There's a um, whole series of those that I've had the on the list. Yeah, the In Call is that yeah. good too? Because that's been on the list of mine. Yeah, for yeah, decades. But the Meta Barons is what he did with his failed Dune script. Oh, have cool. you seen the documentary Yodorowsky's Dune? I, I haven't. I'm aware of it though. But uh... he basically assembled the creative team for Alien. Because when they were like, you're off Dune, yeah. Ridley Scott poached his designers and artists and went on to do Alien. But So he took his um, ultra-violent space opera that was just a little too far from what Frank Herbert had in mind for Dune and um, turned it into a comic book. And it's been going for a long time. Oh, an ongoing comic book. That's baldy. Yeah. Now... You can get volume one and be fine with that. There's a whole bunch of spinoffs. The good thing is that huh. when it when it comes to European comics, it's almost a sure bet that the art is going to be far superior to like mainstream American comics, which are put out on a monthly basis. Whereas the European stuff, it's like, okay, we're finished. Now you can publish it. Right. 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 We we bank them all. We're not trying to meet meet a deadline. Yes. Um, and so uh I totally recommend this book. It is ultra violent. I think you can handle it though, because it's not on the page um, is way different on the page is way different. Yeah. And it's part of the story. 
-hmm. It's not like an element like, oh, and we need to get some violence in here. Like, it's very much a part of the story. One of my favorite comics when I was a teenager was Frank Miller's Hard Boiled with uh, yeah. Jeff Darrow that, and just like staring at all the violence of that one. There's a new hardback edition of that book. Seek it out. They recolored it with Dave Stewart. Dave Stewart has won more Eisner Awards for comic book coloring than anyone. I think he maybe has won more Eisner Awards than anyone. Was he the original colorist too? No. Oh. I don't think so. Okay. No, he he got his start with Hellboy. Ah, okay. And and um, I was in on the ground floor of Hellboy. Oh, really? Tell me. Oh, yeah. what do you... I just mean I bought when that came out. I was really? I followed Mignola's stuff from I forget what he was doing before that, but other superhero stuff I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, Cosmic Odyssey with DC. He was doing lots of like um, well, Batman. Uh, Did he do Gotham Lobo before that? Maybe. What was yeah, it? Batman. Did he do Lobo? any Lobo? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, We're going back. Yeah, I mean, he, well, see, here's the thing is like he did cover art for a lot of stuff. So, like, there's oh, these yeah, famous right. comic books out there because of the cover. And then right. you open it and you're like, hey, this sucks. That's not him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, that's awesome. You know, I did some Hellboy comics. You did? Yeah, I did four two page backup stories for Hellboy. No shit. Wow. Yeah, that's yeah. where the term. I didn't realize who I was talking to. Now I do. That's where the term letter hack comes from. You write a bunch of letters to the editor. You get their attention. They start to send you comics in advance of them being published for your opinion and to write letters about them. Oh. And then they were like, you know, hey, we want to see all the work that you do. And I hacked my way in and I started doing some. I would do like the brief history of a character. Cool. Because the but universe was so dense. They were like characters readers aren't going to know what the hell is going on but did you, you just... do those like on spec and just oh they eventually hired you to do something no yeah i was hired they, they okay. and and it was from my point of view so i was in the comic so it was like it was like this hardcore <laughs> fan talking about the characters and they're like the first one i did was a villain that i hated and so oh. they they had me do a comic about how much i hated the villain while bringing readers up to speed on the history of the character it was really fun it was very meta what year what year was that i'll look for that those were oh i can send you a list i mean it's four individual comics send me your, that send me your resume. Of. Send me your resume. Yeah. <laughs> i think the first one i did was like 2012 2011 i don't know honestly i can't remember exactly when but i sold all the original art what that was exciting. Yeah, there was a guy. I was selling art to some fans of Hellboy because I would do the pencils and then use a light table to trace the inks. So I okay. had copies. Right. And so I could sell them together or separately. And then uh, there was a guy from Denmark, if I recall, who said, hey, can I just I just want to buy everything you have left. And I was like, oh, here's the inventory. You want this? And he goes, yeah, I'll buy it all. He was he like, might have a, been like actually like a Hellboy like he was trying to raise Hellboy somehow. He, like, he was the programming director of the WB for Denmark or wherever it was. And cool. and so I said, look, man, your customs is going to be like outrageous. He goes, eh, it's okay. Send it to me. Damn. <laughs> so he bought me out. Yeah, he bought everything. It was cool. Uh, so is... anyway, now I'm off topic. But uh, no, I like that topic. You so, were talking comics. Yeah, I mean... Don't get me going. I will. You want to hear a list of the comics I've been like? That's another reason why I haven't been watching a lot of movies lately is because I've been reading so many comics. Like, because I finally have shelf space, so I got them all out and, of and like. You get more arm exercise doing that. Your muscles in your arms. Well, yeah, because yeah, I mean, some of these books are like like I'm reading twelve hundred page comics right now. Do you still buy comics like printed comics, or do you yeah. just digital? Okay. Yeah, there's nowhere in my town I'd have to drive an hour, hour and a half to get to a store. So I do a subscription service out of this place called Atomic Empire in Durham, North Carolina. Okay. Yeah. And I they to, are. I, I used to do that. I would get the previews three months before, put yep. in the, the order. It was called At Your Service Subscriptions. I think the guy still exists. He was like in Dallas, Texas. I don't know how oh. I found him. But. Oh, yeah. I had, a, I had a real habit going for a while. I had like a $35 or $40 habit. And the. And as oh. a teenager in high school, that was a, that was a lot. I might be doing like 50 bucks a week right now. <laughs> it's 
crazy. That's, well, it's also 35 years later, so I'm sure the prices have gone yeah. up. Oh, Still big time. Only $1.25 at the time or something. See, I was buying 75 cent comics and when I started, and now they're like, you know, five bucks, six bucks a piece. It's not fair. Well, when I was um, really starting to collect them, I think only like Superman was 75 cents still. Everything else had been a dollar. You know David Sirota? Sure. The guy who was too bored to do your podcast. <laughs> He's awesome. So guess what comic he likes? I can't imagine. Or or uh, he. So I asked him, I said, did you ever read any comic seriously? And he said, yeah, when I was a kid, for some reason, I read Booster Gold. <laughs> And he goes, hey, that character is probably like totally never, nothing ever came of it. And I was like, no, the movie's coming out like in a couple of years. Well, I, James I, I Gunn never is really, making the movie. I think I read some of the, um, I guess it was Peter David, the funny sort of Justice League uh, run. Was that him? Was it Peter David who made it kind of funny? Oh, no. Um, J.M. Dematis or Dematis. Okay. Yeah, I never okay. know how to pronounce it. And Keith Given, okay, uh, yeah. Giffen and yeah. Kevin McGuire. All right, um, that was for a brief moment. I read some of that, and he was in that, but I never read his. Yeah. his that's his my book. sweet spot. That's the great. That's the first comic I ever started collecting every single issue of in 1987. I got every single issue as it came out of um, Justice League of America. Yeah, and then Justice League International is what okay. they ended up calling it. That's my sweet spot. It's just goofy. <laughs> No, that's cool. I, and I feel like Keith, what's his name? He did Legion and then Lobo and yeah. all that stuff. So I, I, I got, I had a big Lobo fetish as a teenager too. An ambush bug. That one, that one's over my head. I just showed that on the live stream last week. I found the first issue in a thrift store. <laughs> I'll just briefly, I'll, I'll ask you, did, did I ever mention that when I was in high school, I um, somehow uh, like social hacked my way into getting Todd McFarlane's phone number, and no, what? I yeah, what? <laughs> he he um, I'll try to tell this as briefly as possible, but don't I, take your time. <laughs> he uh, he was in like People magazine. Okay, so like Spider Man number one came out right, and this was 1990. And this is his Spider Man. Yeah, the McFarlane He's number writing one. and drawing it. Okay. Right. And of course, I bought the silver and the gold, and even yeah. got the platinum for twenty five dollars from the you know from the the, the store only one. The red like, suit, the it. black suit. And, it was yeah. originally it was like the first suckers comic. Like I'm, these are gonna be worth money, and now they're just like you can wipe your ass with them. But I was a huge type of product fan. Going back to Amazing Spider Man just prior, but um, that was it. So he was that comic sold so many copies. He was like written up in People magazine. Yeah, and it was like ooh comic book artist in that like a mainstream entertainment magazine and i forget exactly what it said it said like his wife's name and like where they lived so i called up information like oh. if you have you know it's todd and from like no and i thought like well what about her let's ask for her name and i forget what her name was but they're like no i'm like well is there anyone with that last name and they're like yeah one i'm like all right give me that one so, so i call that number which was apparently his father-in-law i guess and I said, like, I lost Todd's number, uh, and it, or I lost Wanda's number. His, his wife's name is Wanda. Like, used it in Spawn, right? Yeah. I lost. I, I'm an old friend. I lost Wanda's number. Can you get? He's like, yeah. Hang on. I mean, this is so. So I had this number. I'm like, I can't just like call up. Like, this is like I went this far. This is really creepy and ridiculous. I I got to think of something. So I decided I would join my high school newspaper. And this was my sophomore junior year of, of high school. And so I joined the newspaper and, and, and at a certain point I'm like, well, I've got this idea for like a feature story. Like it's not like news, but you know, I can interview this comic book artist and okay. Like, again, this is Revere high school suburb of Akron, Ohio, you know, total of like, I think 600 kids in the whole school. So it was not like it was going to have a wide readership, but to my surprise, I called him up. And I'm just like, hey, I'm a teenager in high school, writing for a newspaper. Can I interview? And he's like, oh, yeah, bud, no problem. I was like, oh, great. He's like, call me back next Tuesday at five o'clock, whatever. I'm like, <laughs> so. Wow. Yeah, I wound up talking to him for like over an hour. And and the, the weirdest part is that somewhere along the line, he mentioned like, oh, I'm I'm starting my own comic book company. This was in between. Image. Oh, wow. He had just finished. He had just quit. By the time I had the guts to call him, he had just quit Spider-Man. 
So he was not doing anything. And he said, oh, yeah, I'm getting together with a bunch of guys. And we're going to start our own comic book company. And it sort of like went in one ear and out the other for me because I just wanted to be like, so what was it like? How's this? What's this? You know, like I was like total. That was your work. exclusive. And yeah. And so I had to call him back. I'm like, oh, wait, what's the name of your new comic? He's like, oh, yeah, it's Spawn. <laughs> I was like, oh, wow. I was like, oh, OK. And um, he sent, even sent us like temp art for the cover of number one. He just said, you got to hold it until you know, February, if you go, some McFarland fan has me on the timeline, like this kid, you know, <sighs> reveals spawn at this time, like before it comes out in an obscure high school newspaper in Akron, Ohio. He even asked me if I had copies of a, the original um, issue, which I don't, but what I do have, and I put it online is the tape. I kept the tape of the, of the recording. Uh, oh, wow. No yeah. way. Yeah. But it even like, um, we got it. We got it. <laughs> I hear that. Yeah, I'll send you the link. It's it's on there. It cuts off after 50 minutes because he kept talking. He was like very generous with his time. Wait, did he send you original artwork? No, he sent me, you know, like mock-up temps, but but it was like the black and white version of the pre-color version of the cover of Spawn. Even that would be valuable now. I guess. Yeah, Go, it would be. Your high school, apparently, I don't know if they kept any of that stuff 30 years ago. So later. who... You're on this timeline. Did they show how how was it breaking it was like, news? Was it, it was, exclusive? It was, by the time by the time it finally was published, I think it had been announced in something else. But it was pretty it was pretty early on. Like Wizard magazine or something. I don't know if it was Wizard um, or where it was, but um, wow, man, that is awesome! I had yeah. no idea because there there was one time in film class you made a reference. You were like, yeah, yeah, it's like. Steve Ditko Spider Man or Todd McFarlane Spider Man? I was like, oh wow, this guy. We've read the oh, yeah. same comics. <laughs> yeah, I did my. Uh, I did I, my time. I don't know if you can see over my shoulder. I have the uh, Spider Man Todd McFarlane art book back there. Or oh, back there. Back. No, I see the garbage pail kids. kids. I'm down yeah, with that. Yeah, it's just down here. Oh, okay. Yep, there it is. That looks like. It looks like the when he quoted himself. Oh no, that's the that's yes, that's an amazing Spider Man. Oh wow, that is huge. I never even knew that existed, but it's because you're locked in more than me. Yeah, this beast is <laughs> it's like all of the original art from his run on Spider Man. It's got some oh, Hulk. wow, it's got his cover of Hulk. Do you ever see that Wolverine where the Hulk is reflecting in his oh, yeah. claws? 340, Incredible Hulk 340. I had it. Yeah, that's in here. Awesome. So, I oh, mean, yeah. just... Marvel Age, I had that one, too. You know, look at... Mm-hmm. So, Hulk just this kind that. of stuff is valuable. So, I'm sure whatever you have. Yeah, I don't know. It was like a photocopy, probably. But, I, yeah, I guess... You don't still have it? No. I, I don't even have a copy of the printed-out issue of the newspaper... I had to get my high school to send me like a scan of like the giant bound version of all the archives that they have. And you'll see it on the link uh, on the YouTube. I put it up as the, one of the images as some of the pages. Uh, Cause I, I was like, going to say, play it out and everything. I was going to say if it's from the guy and it had any kind of like signature or something, it's all gone now. I'm sorry to say, but oh, I do have the audio for the world to hear. That's a great story too. That's fantastic. I had no idea. That's you're so the, cool. You're, you're the target audience here. It's kind of like that 10-year-old that got an interview with John Lennon in his hotel room. Did you ever hear that story? <laughs> no, I never heard that. Yeah, there's a recording of that on YouTube as well. It's it's really, you could tell the kid, it's not a bad interview, but you could tell he's a kid and John Lennon is just kind of like giving him the interview like it's just some guy who showed up to interview him. That's exactly what this was. You hear me going like, um, so like, um, did you hate working there? Like, you know, just like the dumbest type, <laughs> like I'm 16 or maybe 17. You you just have to hear it. It's, it's uh, one time I was designing Olympic ski wear and, and my, a teenager from my old high school called to interview me for the paper. So I know what it's like being on the other end of that. And I thought it was yeah. cool as hell. I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> yeah. You know, like for whatever differences, maybe McFarland and I might have like politically or culturally these days, mm -hmm. like I'll always have complete and total respect for his 
just utter generosity to a, a twerp that had no business just randomly he didn't even say like how would you get this number it was nothing like that it was just pretty sure cool. it's pretty you cool, got man. it kid okay but look i don't want to keep you all night thank you so I'm much for being here i know you have an event tomorrow do you want to plug that and plug anything well, yeah, if, any, if anybody is uh, in new york city and uh, want to come see me do the film guy thing in person in Queens tomorrow night at Sanger Hall as part of the movie night extravaganza. Um, other uh, another movie podcast of some uh, connection they had Sam on uh, a couple weeks ago. So uh, there are a bunch of guys doing good stuff over there and we're doing a live show. So come out and see we're going to be talking about mean streets. So come see the mooks doing their thing. Yeah, I love movie night extravaganza. Um, every time they're not on a Tuesday, I intend to live stream in their place. Um, yeah, they're great. And you were great on there, and Sam. Yeah, exactly. And Sam was great on there. I want to go on there. I, I'd love to go on there. I, I don't know. Did they you should get absolutely to... have you on there. I'll talk to them about it. Do it. Yes. Let's get it. Let's get the pressure campaign going. Did you recommend the movie or did they? No. They, they asked me, like, would you do it? And I said, sure. Because, you know, I've loved that movie in the past. Um, it's one of my more favorite Scorsese movies. So I'm down to this. And I haven't seen it in forever. So it'll be a fun excuse to to watch it again. Hmm. I wonder what movie they would choose. Like, did they choose it for you, though? Or it was just in, in the queue? past? They've asked me, like, I've done it like two or three times. And once they're just like, would do you want to come on and talk about this movie? And I say yes or no. And then they say, well, what would you pick? And I, I, I picked John Dillman that the. Uh, Chantal Ackerman movie that classic on sight and sound pole. Yeah. So it's it go both ways actually. Um, huh. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, um, if anyone's in New York tomorrow, check that out. Go to um, Matthew film guys, Twitter again, that is uh, in the description of this podcast and also check out uh, movie night extravaganzas, Twitter. Um, and come join Matt and me in class uh, yes. at the Common Point Queens. It's online. It's on Zoom. Check out the link. Uh, a fresh link will come up soon. And you can jump on at any time and just pay for the classes that have uh, already, you know, that aren't already elapsed. So by all means, come talk some serious film guide stuff with us. It's it fun. is very user friendly. Um, and also follow me on Twitter at the letter hack and Instagram at friends of track Find. You can see the final artwork from tonight when I touch it up in post and then put that up and I'll put up the work in progress tomorrow with a link to the replay when the live chat is available. Uh, and look, I'm streaming more often this Saturday, um, which is the 27th of May. I'm going to have Jason miles on oh, and, nice. and another special guest to talk about Star Wars. It's a Star Wars appreciation show because we're going to wrap up the month of Star Wars, which I call Star Wars month. <laughs> mm. uh, and, uh, you know, for reasons we'll discuss, but I'll, we're also going to have a special guest, Andrew Matranga. I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I got to get him to hook me up. And, and it's wrong of me to not be able to pronounce it because we used to work together back in Colorado. This guy teaches Star Wars. Um, he is like college level courses on, on this stuff. So he is a master of the subject and everyone knows Jason miles from sublation magazine. And this is revolution podcast is also an, uh, expert, uh, writer and uh, podcaster about pop culture and politics and, and both combined. So this will be a really metal, heavy metal artist as well. And that as well. Yes. And so this is going to be, and, and Andrew's a musician too. So I'm, I'm happy to like connect these guys. So that's this Saturday. And then Monday, even though it's Memorial day, we don't take holidays off. I have Twitch streamer, $27 coming on. So this is for, you know, I have a global audience here, Matthew. I got people from all over the world that come into the chat. So, this will well, be you for just made Scottish. another subscriber out of me, definitely. Today. Oh, great. Nice. Right on. Well, go back and watch all the other live um, interviews. And also, I make clips. So there's more accessible and quicker ways to absorb this content. Uh, thanks again for being here, man. I really do appreciate it. And uh, I'm glad we got to talk. It's been too long. And I look forward to being back in the class for sure. Matt, thanks um, for having me. I had so much fun. I would love to do it anytime you want it again. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in the class. Okay, great. Yeah. In the meantime, tell everyone I said hi and I miss them. Uh, and I'll see everybody here Saturday and next Monday, 9.30 p.m. Eastern time. Thanks, guys. Bye.